Welcome back to The Mindful Hunter. I'm your host as always, Jay Nickel, and today we're gonna do another comprehensive spotting scope review. This time focusing on the 65 millimeter category, specifically looking at the Tracked Toric Swarovski ATS, Maven CS1A, Kawa Promenar TSN 66A, and the Leica APO Televid 65. Now, I analyzed these spotting scopes across five different classes. These included descriptive, construction, optics, performance, and operation. And within those five classes, I looked at 25 different categories and basically ranked these scopes one through five across each category. Now, the goal of this review is to come up with a quantifiable winner. So the best scope in each category gets a one, and then they get ranked further on down the list, two, three, four, and five, with the worst spotting scope in each category getting a five. Now, I tried to limit the draws as much as possible, but it does happen from time to time. But I can tell you, we did end up with a clear winner, and I will be raffling off that winner. So if you stay tuned until the end of this video, I'm gonna tell you how you can enter a raffle to win the best spotting scope out of these five. Now, before we dive into the review itself, again, a quick reminder, if you like these types of non-sponsored, unbiased reviews and you wanna see more of them, go join Mindful Reviews. That's the online community-based review platform that I've built from the ground up. You can participate in choosing what gets reviewed. You can buy raffle tickets for the gear that I raffle off. Lifetime members get entered into a monthly draw for kick-ass prizes. And on top of all that, there's a great community forum with lots of people asking good questions, giving great advice, and just overall, it's a very supportive and engaging community. So that's mindful-reviews.com. A while ago, I did an 85 millimeter category-wide spotting scope review and looked at six different spotting scopes. You can go see that video right here. I'm gonna try and make this video a little bit shorter. I had to go over a lot of basics about manufacturing, glass selection, lens coatings, and I'm gonna try and keep those conversations shorter in this video while still giving the new viewer a good you know, baseline so they can understand how I came to the conclusions that I did. But if you're interested in a more thorough conversation or you, you want some more background on any of those categories, I highly recommend watching that original review. It's quite long and there's a lot of information presented, but if it's the kind of thing you're interested in, I think it's a really valuable resource. One last note about the raffle before we dive into this. When I raffle off really high-end optics, they tend to go really fast. So if you look in the description for this video right now, you'll see the details on how to access the raffle. If you're really interested in getting a ticket, I would recommend pausing the video, going and looking at that, deciding if you wanna buy a ticket and then coming back and watching the rest of the video just so it doesn't sell out while you're actually watching the video. Also, if you're watching this at a later date, you know, multiple days or weeks after the original posting, I will keep the description updated. As soon as the raffle sells out, I will note so in the description. I will also note so on my website at mindful-reviews.com. And that way you will know right away if there's still tickets available or not. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the spreadsheet that I use to score and rank all the spotting scopes, I have it broken down into class and category. So again, I have five classes and across those five classes, I have 25 categories. Now, the first class we're gonna look at is descriptive. The categories within that class are price, weight, length, angled and straight, and origin. So we're gonna go through each of these quickly and then I'll discuss the class as a whole. All the following prices are in USD, moving from the cheapest to the most expensive. The Maven at 800, the Tract at 1249, the Swaro at 2669, Leica at 2849, and the Kawa at 2999. So you're gonna notice we basically have two price groups. We have the lower end price group of the more affordable optics with the Maven and the Tract at 800 and 1250. And then we have the higher end optics grouped between 2669 and 2999, which is only about a 10% discrepancy between the three more high end optics. Next, we're gonna move on to weight. Now, typically I like to look at the advertised weight compared to the actual weight. And there oftentimes is a very wide discrepancy 
That was not the case with these. All of these spotting scopes were within one ounce of their advertised weight. However, just to be as precise as possible, I am going to share the weights that I weighed here, not their advertised weight. Again, we will start at the lightest and then move up to the heaviest. So the Maven comes in at 40.6 ounces, the Swaro at 50 ounces even, Tracked at 52.9, Kawa at 53.7, and the Leica at 54.5. So I think the Maven, we can discuss this right now, the Maven is a bit of a standout in this crowd. It is significantly smaller and significantly cheaper than the rest of these spotting scopes. Now you will pay a price for that, in optical quality. So I, I wanna compare the weights, but I, I kinda almost wanna set the Maven aside because while it is 10 ounces lighter than the Swaro, it's not really an apples to apples comparison because you're not getting anywhere near the optical performance that you do get with the Swaro. However, when we look at the rest of the spotting scopes, they all fall within a four and a half ounce range from 50 ounces up through to 54.5 ounces. So while I think it's important to note weight, I don't really see it being a critical factor in your purchase decision here because none of these scopes provides such an, a weight or optical discrepancy that it would really cause me to, to, to hinge my buying decision on that factor alone. Lots of times, like if I'm looking at a shelter or a gun or a backpack, there could be up to a 30 or 35% discrepancy in weight between two of the items that I'm looking at. Um, and that's just simply not the case here. And the takeaway from this is that glass is heavy and quality glass is even heavier for the most part. And so there's no free lunch in the optics world. If you want good glass, you're gonna be carrying some weight and there's nothing you can do about it. Next, we're gonna move on to length. And I viewed this as like the practical length from tip to tip, from like the furthest part of the of the back to the to the front. So it's like how much room it would actually take up in your pack. I didn't measure along the curvature. So again, we'll go from shortest to longest. The Maven at 11.1, the Kawa at 14.1, tied with the Leica at 14.1, the Swaro at 14.2, and the Tract at 14.5. So again, if we exclude the Maven, we only have a 0.4 inch discrepancy between our shortest and longest scope. So much like weight, I wouldn't use this to significantly sway your purchase decision. Unlike when we did the 85 millimeter spotting scope review, there was a vast discrepancy in there between some of the sizes and some of the weights. The Leica is the only one to not offer both a straight and an angled version. So. All the rest of these you can buy in both straight or angled. Leica has discontinued the straight version of this particular spotter. And just to clear things up, I wanna give a shout out to Tract. They were good enough to send me this spotting scope for review. I don't get to keep it. I don't get to raffle it off. I don't get to do anything with it. As soon as the review is done, I put it back in the box and I ship it back to them. But I wanna give them some credit for having enough confidence in their gear to send it over for you know, a fulsome and robust review that's not sponsored and they have no idea what I'm gonna say about it and they're okay with that. But I did wanna explain why this happens to be the one straight spotting scope. There was just a, a mix up in the ordering and they were supposed to send an angled and I got a straight by accident. So it doesn't affect the optical clarity, but I did wanna point that out as I'm sure I'm gonna get a couple of questions. Also, while the Leica is gonna get a point deducted because it doesn't offer both, I myself don't like straight spotting scopes and even trying to review this tract reminded me why even more why I don't like straight spotting scopes. There's just, especially when you're a backcountry hunter and you're sitting a lot of times, you're not bringing full size tripods, trying to get it in a uh, position where your neck isn't being cranked and it's actually comfortable. To, it's so much nicer to just look down into your spotting scope and have a nice field of view as opposed to trying to line up this straight one. But anyways, to reiterate, Leica is the only one that doesn't offer both a straight and angled version. Now the next category is origin. And the reason I do this is because it says a lot about the build quality and the quality of the lenses and the coatings. And this is gonna come across as somewhat ethnocentric, but 
There's a fairly clear pecking order about country of origin and quality of manufacture. For the most part, this is not, you know, hard and fast written rule, but for the most part, the best optics come out of Europe, the second best optics come out of Japan, and the third best optics come out of China. Obviously, there's some, you know, discrepancies there and it's not always the case, but that's a good general rule to follow. So coming in at first place is the Swaro and the Leica because they are both of European manufacturer. And then the Kawa, Tract, and Maven all tie for second place because they're made in Japan. So if we look at the descriptive class as a whole, the Maven comes in first and then Swaro, Tract, Kawa, and Leica. So if things like price and weight are ultimately what is most important to you, this is the class that you would want to weigh most heavily in your buying decision. Up next, we're going to move on to the construction class. And within this class, we have five categories, warranty, hardware, weather resistance, frame material, and internally gas purge. So first we'll discuss warranty. And basically I'm trying to reward companies that offer a better warranty. So coming in in first place, tied is Maven and Tract. I would say this is the new breed of warranties, like Maven, Tract, Vortex, Loophold. They all offer these unconditional lifetime warranties. You could throw it off your house, you could drive over, your, over it with your truck, you can do anything you want to it, and the warranty will cover it. The one caveat I'm gonna note here is that on the whole, if companies offer this type of warranty, there's a good chance you're gonna need it. I always give my Vortex example, I own four different Vortex optics over the course of my hunting career so far. I currently own none. Every single one of those optics had to be sent back in for a warranty repair that had nothing to do with me. Um, and so just keep that in mind. The nice thing is it also makes it really easy to sell because nobody's ever worried like is the lens scratched or is there a slight ding on the outside because if they get it and, not, and it's not perfect, there's no receipt required, there's no proof of purchase required, there's no date of purchase required. You can literally just ship this thing in and they will more than likely just send you a brand new scope. So it does offer significant peace of mind. Coming in at second place is Leica. Now Leica offers a 10 year no fault warranty and then a limited lifetime warranty. So what that means is for the first 10 years from the date of purchase, you can throw it off a roof, you can drive over it, you can do whatever you want to it and they will fix it or replace it. Then for the lifetime of the optic, after that last first 10 years, any manufacturer or uh, material defect will be repaired free of charge. And then tied for third place, you have Kawa and Swaro. They both offer a 10 year limited warranty. So there is no unlimited warranty with either the Swaro or the Kawa. So if you drive over it or throw it off your house, you're screwed. So we're gonna to move to hardware. Now in hardware, specifically with spotting scopes, what I'm looking at is the two lens covers, the mounting device, and whatever lock and locking mechanism they offer for the uh, pivot or spinning that an angled spotting scope typically does. So all of these get equal score. They all have plastic knobs, which is not my favorite thing for the locking mechanism that controls the spinning of the body. And they all have fairly decent lens covers. There's none of them really stand out. And none of them are really terrible. The one exception to this um, is the Swarovski in the mounting department. So all Swarovski spotters now, and you can tell this is an updated version of the ATS because it has this mount. All Swarovski spotters come with an Arca Swiss compatible mount. So with all the rest of these spotting scopes, you need to put some type of quick plate adapter on the bottom, depending on what type of uh, tripod head or mount you use. Now Arca Swiss is quickly becoming the kind of dominant form factor for adapter plates and housings. And so I really like what Swarovski has done here because it's always a pain in the ass. They always have a tendency to come loose. You'll forget your Allen wrench and you can't take it off when you need it. Like there's just a bunch of reasons why those adapter plates are a pain in the ass. And the fact that the majority of the industry is moving towards Arca Swiss and, and Swarovski has just kind of said, you know, let's do it. We're gonna go in with both feet. And, and make their adapt. Because the other thing is you don't have anything to lose. If you don't use Arca Swiss, you still put whatever adapter plate you have on the bottom of that mount, just like you would on any of these other ones. 
So I would really like to see the rest of these manufacturers move towards that Arca Swiss mount on the bottom. Now I just wanna make a quick note about the category of build quality. So this used to be a category that I would use to try and assess the individual build quality of each of these spotting scopes. But in my reviews, I'm gonna delete this moving forward. Because without some type of like longitudinal testing or large sample base surrounding durability, it's a very subjective category and I'm just basically looking at it, trying to ascertain which one was built better than the other. And I've, I've recognized that there are other proxy categories that do a better job. For instance, country of origin of manufacture, the level of weather resistance, the material used for the frames, what type of gas they use to internally purge these. When you look at all of those other categories, which are objective and quantifiable, they kind of culminate to give you an idea of the overall build quality. So I'm not going to be assessing build quality independently moving forward. So on that note, let's talk about weather resistance. So coming in at first place is the Leica. You can submerge the Leica up to five meters or 16.5 feet. You will also see this notated as 500 M bar or 500 millibar. And that is the amount of atmospheric pressure that is placed on an object when it's at a certain depth underwater. After that, we move on to the Swarovski, which can be submerged up to four meters or 13 feet. And then tied for third place is all the rest. So the Maven and the Tract have an IPX7 rating. Now IP stands for ingress protection. The X would notate the solids, like how large of a solid it's protected against ingress. Because it has an X, it's not giving you a solid rating. So there is no technical dust rating for, for, for any of these devices, actually. And the second number uh, dictates how water resistant it is. So the numeral seven indicates that you can submerge this up to one meter for 30 minutes. So... Um, again, the Leica, you can go to five meters, the Swarrow, you can go to four meters, and the Tract and the Maven and the Kawa, you can go to one meter. Now, the reason that you can use that to deduce a ranking for build quality is that the deeper you submerge it, the more pressure gets exerted on the optics. So the quality of the O-rings, how tight the manufacturing tolerances are, how good the seals are, the better all those elements are, the greater pressure the optic is able to withstand before it compromises its integrity to water. And finally, just for transparency's sake, uh, Kawa was good enough to get back to me because they don't list this information anywhere on their website. But again, they're manufactured in Japan and technically their ranking is a JIS-7, which stands for uh, Japan Industry Standards. And the seven is analogous to the IPX-7. It's, it's an equivalent ranking. Up next, we're gonna go to the frame material. So all of these are made out of a magnesium alloy. The only difference is that the Maven also has some aluminum components. Magnesium is superior to aluminum, so everybody's gonna get one point and then Maven is gonna get knocked down to second place. Now this is something else you wanna pay attention to because people will assume that all of the optics coming from a manufacturer will be made the same way with the same components and that is not the case. You know, I think it's very intuitive that in different lines they would use different glass but I don't think most people think that they would also use different frame materials. So if you move up to the Maven S1 line which is their kind of flagship spotting scope it is made with a magnesium alloy and polymer. So it's a higher grade material. When you get down to the CS line, they use lower grade materials. Also interesting to note here, all of these scopes except for the tract are internally purged with nitrogen. I would say that's the industry standard. Tract on the other hand is purged with argon. Now there's two things to note about argon. It has a higher thermal conductivity and it's heavier than nitrogen. So the greater thermal conductivity allows it to dissipate heat internally from the optic faster so it can regulate temperature better between inside and outside more quickly. And the fact that it's heavier and more dense means it provides more resistance from outside elements getting in. So in that regard, the, the argon is a superior, superior material to nitrogen. 
It's really odd. I've done a bunch of research and I still can't find out why. The only two manufacturers I know of that use Argon are uh, Vortex and Tract, neither of which are alpha glass. And Argon is more expensive than nitrogen. And so I can't understand why they would be spending money on a superior, more money on a superior material when they don't have to, to compete with these other guys. The only thing I'm thinking is maybe it allows them to get away with cutting some corners on O-rings and seals and other things. I don't know. I'm not saying that they're doing that, but maybe by using a superior uh, air to purge, it, it, it buffers or, you know, makes up for some other decision that they've made or compromise in the building process. I don't know. Uh, just interesting to note. So looking at the construction class totals, Tract comes in first place and then Leica, Maven, Swarovski, and Kawa. Now we're going to move to the optics class, which was designed to basically look at the manufacturing construction of the glass lenses within the spotting scopes. And inside this class, we're going to look at magnification, field of view, glass quality, glass coatings, and eye relief. So let's discuss magnification first. Uh, coming in at first place is Kawa, then Leica, Swaro, Maven, and Tract. So the Kawa goes all the way from 25 to 60. It is the only spotting scope here that goes above 50 power. The Leica and the Swaro are tied at going from 25 to 50. The Tract goes from 22 to 45, and the Maven goes from 15 to 45. And so I think it's interesting to note here that the more expensive the spotting scopes get, the higher the magnification gets. And something you're gonna notice is that in the middle of the road of the zoom potential of an optic, it operates pretty well. Where you tend to see optics fall apart is at the extent of the zoom range. So if you look at something 400 yards away at 30 power on the Maven or the Tract, it looks decent. If you look at something two miles away at 45 power, which is the greatest power they go to, that's when you start to notice the, the kind of limitations of the kind of more value-based scopes that they are. When you move up into the higher end glass, like Kawa being the most expensive piece of glass here, it has the highest magnification. And when we get into later the optical performance, you will note that it retains like tact like detail and clarity all the way up to the full 60 power. Just as how far we can zoom in is important, how wide our field of view is equally important. Your eye tends to pick up movement. So a lot of people, I'm not sure everyone really considers how important field of view is because if you have a smaller field of view and you have to move the spotting scope more often, there's less time when your eye is just going to be exposed to a greater surface area and you can pick up like a little ear flick or a little time moving off in the corner of the viewable area of the spotting scope. So field of view is one of the things I look for first in an optic, like everything else being equal, if one optic has a greater field of view than another optic, it's something that should really influence your buying decision because that's a functional improvement. Like you're more likely to see more game with a larger field of view, all other things being equal. Going from the best to the worst, we go Leica, Kawa, Swarovski, Tract, and Maven. Let me give you some insight into how I graded this particular category because just looking at the absolute figures doesn't give you enough context. You need to be comparing them at similar powers of zoom. So the Leica at 25 power has 134 feet viewable area at 1,000 yards. The Kawa at 25 is 126, so not quite as good. The Swaro at 25 has 126, so equally not as good. Now the Tract has 131, which you think would then, oh, so it's better. But remember, the tract goes all the way down to 22 power. Now, the way you define or the way you calculate field of view is you multiply the viewing angle by 52.5. And your viewing angle changes based on how much you zoom in or zoom out. So essentially what I did was I compared the viewable area 
at similar powers, you know, and a really good example here, like the two that we can put head to head are the Leica and the Swaro, because they both have 65 millimeter objective lenses and they both zoom from 25 to 50. And the Leica goes from 134 feet to 92 feet and the Swaro goes from 126 feet to 81 feet. So you, you know that the Swaro's viewing angle is smaller than the Leica's viewing angle and they have the same um, zoom capability. Um, so you can say very clearly that the Leica has a superior field of view compared to the Swarovski, objectively. Okay, that's enough about field of view. Let's move on to glass quality. Now this can be tricky to rank because spotting scope manufacturers are not super forward and transparent about the type of glass they use. They use a lot of proprietary terms. They won't give you like percentages of fluorite content or all the rest, but I've been doing reviews long enough now and I know where all the different glasses stand in relation to each other. So I'll try and explain it to you a little bit, but essentially in first place comes Kawa. Kawa uses fluorite crystal, which is arguably the best optical grade glass on the planet. Now, some people are going to say, well, Swaro is better than Kawa. You need to remember this is the Swaro ATS, not the Swaro ATX. And so there is a small difference between the glass in those two particular units. So while I would agree that putting the Kawa up against the ATX glass there would probably be very little difference there. That fluorite crystal is definitely superior to the glass used in the ATS, although by a very slim margin, it is superior nonetheless. Now, funny enough, we move on into second place, and remember, we're talking about glass quality, not lens coating quality. Tract has a license to use shot HT glass. This is the same glass that's used in uh, Zeiss's premium line. So the Zeiss Harpia spotting scope uses shot HT glass. The Zeiss Victory Binos uses shot HT glass. Now they have proprietary Zeiss coatings that I would argue separate that viewing experience for the viewing experience provided by Tract. But if we are limiting our analysis to the quality of the glass itself, that HT glass is the second best glass on this table. And then tied at third place, we have Swaro and Leica. Now, all we technically know is that they use fluoride containing glass. We don't know how much fluoride is in there. We don't know what other elements are part of it. Um, all we know is that they're fluoride containing. So they're tied for third place. And then in last place, we have Maven. All Maven really says is ED glass, which stands for extra low dispersion. Doesn't really get into, you know, the different elements that are used in the glass or the manufacturing process or anything like that. So it comes in last place. So here's another example where we can see a discrepancy between the Maven lines. So the Maven CS, this one, spotting scope, uses ED glass. The Maven S1 spotting scope uses a fluorite glass. So even on their own comparison spec sheet, they will note the higher quality glass used in the S1 series. Again, I talked about it earlier, but the main difference between the ATS and the ATX is that the, the S line does not get Swarovision or the field flattening lenses. Um, the ATX does. The other thing to remember here is that the ATC and the STC line those new mini spotters, they use the same glass and coatings as the ATX, not as the ATS. I think a really good way to think about this would be like the difference between an NL Pure and an EL. The EL are phenomenal binoculars. The NLs are just that one step better. I think the ATS is a phenomenal spotting scope with amazing glass, but the ATX is just that one little step better. Something else I find incredibly interesting, Leica's premium binoculars, the Noctavids, use shot HT glass. They have the same license that Tract has. However, they use a proprietary glass, a proprietary fluorite glass in 
the Leica spotting scope and they don't license that shot HT even though it's better glass. So I'm very interested as to, to why that is the case. But anywhere, that's an idea of how I, you know, ranked the quality of glass across all five scopes. Now we move to glass coatings, which arguably is more complicated and more hard to define than quality of glass itself. So let's just walk through these one scope at a time. So coming in in first place is the Kawa and the Leica. So Kawa uses three different coatings, uh, CR, C3, KR, and Phase. They're fully multi-coated. Again, I'm just gonna be honest. I don't know the exact, you know, how those lens coatings are made, how they're applied, exactly what they do from a physics perspective. But I do know from what I've read and birding forums and other glass experts that the coatings themselves um, are superior to a lot of the other coatings. And then if we look at the Leica, not only are they fully multi-coated, they also use the Leica proprietary Aquadura coating. And then just behind that, we have the Swarovski, which, is, which uses the Swaro Top, Swaro Dur, and Swaro Clean. And see what I mean? Like, you can intuit what those likely do, but you don't have any mathematical way to define one being better than the other, other go than going on like general research and looking at other experts' opinions of the particular coatings. And then the two that are, that are tied for last place are the Maven and the Tract. And in all their literature, all they say is fully multi-coated. So this is another way that you can use to, you know, in a layman's sense, figure out which one has better coatings. Like the kind of baseline table stakes is this fully multi-coated. All the rest of the spotters will also be fully multi-coated, but then in addition to that fully multi-coating, they will have, you know, Swaro Dur or Aquadura or KR coatings that it's almost like, you know, upgrading your fast food order or when you go in to buy, you know, a pair of sunglasses and then paying extra for the polarizing. Like they've got the, the baseline covered and then the three kind of big guys also do something in addition. Okay, let's take a quick look at eye relief. So spotting scopes take an image in front of you, they magnify it, and then that image is essentially like reconstructed at a point in space just behind the spotting scope. And when you put your eye in the exact right location, you're perfectly lined up to see. A really simple way of, of putting this is the distance you need to have your eye from the spotting scope in order to achieve a perfect sight picture. Now, the longer this distance, typically the more comfortable the viewing experience because it creates a longer eye box. Like there's more area in which you're comfortable looking through the spotting scope. The same thing goes for rifle scopes. Everybody's had a rifle scope that's super finicky. Like, if your face is not in the exact right location, you won't get that full sight picture. Now, that's because there's a very short eye relief on that scope. So longer eye relief, better eye box, more comfortable viewing experience. Now, if we're gonna rank these, Leica comes in first, Kawa and Swaro tied for second, and Maven and Tract in third place. So you can see how as we start to really pick apart the categories, it's not like, like I don't look through the less expensive spotting scopes and just say, oh, these aren't as good. When you start to look at the actual technical elements, it's like, it's almost like the death of a thousand cuts because it's not like any one of these knocks the other one out of the park. But when you go through 10 or 15 different categories and you know some of the big guys are just that little bit, a couple of percent better at each one, like, the difference between the eye relief between the Tract and the Kawa is one millimeter. It's not that big a deal. But when you add those types of things up again and again and again, you end up with like, you know, a high end, really expensive piece of optics and a more affordable kind of budget friendly piece of optics that is still very usable, but doesn't provide that same kind of world class experience that the Alpha Glass does. Okay, so if we looked at the totals in the optics class all together, we have Kawa in first place, and then Leica, Swaro, Tract, Maven. And up till now, I want to be clear, we're, we, we, we've been pretty objective about this. This is not a, a subjective ranking of the elements in these spotting scopes. This is, you know, quantifiable 
evidence-driven ranking. As we move on now into the performance and the operation classes, there is a more subjective approach simply because there's not really a way to quantify a lot of these categories. So up first we have performance. This is made up of this is made up of four different categories. Image crispness, low light performance, edge to edge clarity and chromatic aberration. So the way I rank these is that I take all these spotting scopes out several times in several different kind of lighting and weather conditions and I live in Vancouver so there's lots of foggy times, there's lots of clear times, there's lots of high humidity times and low humidity times. Not as many low humidity times as you would like, but you kind of make do. And I try and get, you know, low light, lots of light, kind of rainy, kind of foggy. And I literally sit down and I have a clipboard with my spreadsheet written out on a piece of paper and I rank all of these. And I try and do it as unbiased as possible. And I try to do it as many times as possible so that I get, make sure that my rankings have a chance to um, be consistent across several different viewing applications. So I'm not going to get into the individual scores. If you're interested, this spreadsheet is available for Mindful Reviews members, mindful-reviews.com. You can download this, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to go over the general rankings. So uh, Kawa came in first place. Leica and Swaro tied for second place. Tract was in fourth, and then Maven was in fifth. Now, once I get done with the operation class, I'm also gonna give you my anecdotal notes. And this is more like a real world, my interpretation of the performance and operation capabilities of these spotting scopes that maybe doesn't you know, quite get caught by the numbers as well. But if we move on to the operation class, we have again, four different categories. Ergonomics, Focus, iBox, and Zoom. And looking at this class, Leica comes in first place, then Kawa, then Swaro, and Maven and Tract are tied for fourth place. So let me share some of my anecdotal notes about each of these spotting scopes in those two classes. One of the biggest drawbacks of the Maven, as I mentioned earlier, is its inability to really get a tack sharp image at distance at full zoom. And this is a function of just, you know, lower quality glass in a smaller, lighter spotting scope. Uh, it's just the price you have to pay. And I'm going to get onto the highlights of the Maven later when I do my final wrap up thoughts. The Maven also has a slightly darker image. Like when you're going back and forth between it and the other ones, it's just simply not as bright. So you're going to pay a bit of a penalty for the Maven in lower light situations. Like those dawn and dusk moments when you're really trying. I'm about to head to Colorado for a second rifle mule deer. And I know the first half an hour and the last half an hour of the day are gonna be critical times to be looking for game. The Maven is probably not my first choice for that type of hunt because those times of day are so important. I'm gonna want a spotting scope that has better light gathering capabilities than the Maven. If we go to the Swaro, uh, one of the things that kind of took a hit for the focus drum is not very precise. And I'm going to get into the double barrel focus knobs in a moment. But we have three spotting scopes here that use a single drum to adjust focus. So you don't have a coarse and a fine adjustment. You just have one adjustment. Of the three of them, the Swaro is the hardest to dial in at full zoom at distance. And again, I kind of use that as an example because that's when you're asking the most of your spotting scope. Essentially, how this manifests is you end up rolling focus past your object multiple times before you like get it to line up perfect. Like you'll, and I think it's just because the focus adjustment is a little bit too coarse. The flip side of that coin is if it was more fine, it would take you a lot more movement to get things from like different, you know, depths of focus from different distances. Um, but that is a bit of a drawback to the Swarovski in general. A couple of notes about the Kawa. Remember, all the other limits are 45 and 50 power, and the Swaro goes all the way up to 60 power. Not only does it go to 60, it stays tack sharp at 60. A difference of 10 power is a really noticeable difference. Like when you are zoomed in at 50 with the Swaro and zoomed in at 60 on the Kawa on the same object, 
you are getting significantly more detail out of the Kawa. The same can be said of the Leica. When we compare all three at 50 power, it gets much more difficult to tell them apart. But if you were gonna be aging a sheep, for example, I think the extra 10 power, like if you're gonna be counting rings, or if you're going on a, if you're going for, for goat, like anything where aging is hypercritical, I think the Kawa and that extra 10X really stand apart. Also, like we were talking about with the Swaro, this, the focus adjustment is superb on the Kawa. I am blown away. I've played with the 88 and the 66 now, and the physical viewing kind of experience is, I, I almost, it's like setting a new bar for me. Like I almost don't want to own any more spotting scopes that don't have a coarse and defined adjustment because it's just so much more pleasant and you can switch between objects of interest so much quicker. And you don't spend this time kind of fiddling with your focus all the time. Now, the Leica also has a double barrel focus adjustment and it is very good. But one of the things that separates the Leica from the Kawa is the hand feel of the operation. For instance, you know, when you go to switch zoom, you get this like buttery smooth there's no herky-jerky start and stops. It doesn't stick. You get this nice constant tension. It feels, it's just a really pleasant experience. That that Did you see how hard that was and then it kind of let go? Even the sound of it, it, it feels almost not papery in there, but there is more of an, of an, a lack of constant. You know what, you know what it feels like? This feels like a fluid pan head, and this feels like a metal on metal pan head, where one is just way more smooth and continuous than the other. And that can be said of these other zoom dials as well. Like the Kawa is notably the best. And if I, if I go back to my final rankings and look at the zoom category, you know, Kawa comes in first, Leica comes in second, Swaro comes in third, the Maven comes in at fourth. And the thing that I didn't like about the Toric is how much pressure you have to exert to twist this zoom dial. And I want people to remember, it's not like a pair of binos, okay, with a focus knob where you're at 10 power and your field of view is gigantic. When you are zoomed in to 45X and you're trying to like age a sheep or you know, estimate the score of a mule deer buck and your spotter moves like a quarter of an inch on your tripod, that animal's not even in your field of view anymore. So every time one of these knobs or dials is sticky or too hard to move or kind of herky jerky is just one more time you have an opportunity to kind of bump or adjust your field of view. And that's what kept happening to me with the track. Like you'd push, push, push. And when it finally twisted, you realize, you know, you kind of shifted a degree or two on your tripod head. So anyways, those are some of the kind of highlights and lowlights of the performance and operation class. I will get into like a more overall discussion about where these spotting scopes sit once I share the final rankings. All right, you made it this far. You deserve to know who the winner was. In first place, we have the Kawa with a score of 44 points. In second place, we have the Leica, one point behind with a score of 45. Uh, very close margin, the Swaro with 48. And then we go to the Tract with a 67 and the Maven with a 69. Again, something that I would like to say about analyzing so many categories and attempting to quantify the results of each of those categories with, with by evidence and, and research is that when you get to these numbers, like you're gonna, there's a pretty big spread there. Like there's only four points difference between the Kawa, the Swaro, and the Leica. Like, and, and you go back over the spreadsheet and it's like, I could see how different people with different opinions might've given like a little one point here or there. Like there is, you know, it's funny when you watch uh, bodybuilding and two guys will get first or second and then the, the, the pundits will be talking about it afterwards and somebody will say, you know, I wouldn't have got mad if the guy in second got first. And that's a way of saying they're so close that 
it was a really very minor difference. I feel the same way about the Kawa, the Swara, and the Leica. Really, a little bit of difference here. Any one of those scopes could have wound up in first place. I do believe the Kawa has a couple of features that does place it above the other two, but the Leica and the Swaro are almost just bang on in performance. And then you will see we have almost a 20 point jump down to 67 and 69 where the Tract and the Maven live. I don't want to say these are not good options. They are good options for certain situations and certain budgets. But I don't pe want people to get confused. The, these are This is not alpha glass. This is not a direct competitor for those kind of like big premium spotters. However, I still think there are definite situations and deficit, definite budgets where these are really good choices. Okay, so before I get into my final thoughts, let's talk about the raffle. Obviously, the Kawa is the winner, so we're raffling off the Kawa. So if you wanna participate in this raffle, you need to go to Mindful Reviews, mindful-reviews.com. Remember to check the notes in the description and make sure that the raffle is still open. If you're already a member, you would have already got an email notification that raffle tickets are available. If you're not, join up. You'll be given access to the community. And then there's a link there that shows you where you can go buy tickets. I would estimate that it will only be open for about a week. The last spotting scope review I did sold out incredibly quickly. And I know that a lot of people are very eager to get their hands on this 66. This was a game-changing spotter for me. I am fairly certain I'm gonna go buy one. Um, I think it is as close to a one-size-fits-all solution as you can possibly get. It's not cheap, but I think the price tag is supported by the kind of viewing experience that it offers. If you wanna participate in the raffle, click the link below, go to the site, buy some tickets. I wish you the best of luck. Now, let's have a bit of a conversation about you know, how the rest of these spotting, spotting scopes fall into place. So clearly, if budget isn't an issue and you want the best of the best, I would get the Kawa. A lot of people are gonna say, why didn't you have the ATX in here? I've looked through the ATX. I compared the 85 ATX to the 88 Kawa. In that particular review, the ATX eked out a small win over the Kawa 88. I really believe when you look at those two spotting scopes, they are so comparable, it's really personal opinion. And I'm gonna bring a new element into this discussion, and that's your risk tolerance. If you are a low risk tolerance person, like you don't like making big decisions that could have big outcomes or you know, present a large opportunity for, for risk, probably go with a Swaro ATX. The name brand power of Swaro is so powerful, you will be able to sell that thing in a heartbeat. There are still plenty of people who don't even know what a Kawa spotting scope is. So even though, for example, between this and the ATS, I think the Kawa is a, is a superior spotting scope, if you had these two, this ATS is gonna sell 10 times as fast as the Kawa. So if you ever get to the point where you change your mind, you're gonna be pretty heavily invested in a piece of glass that is not gonna be as liquid on the market as the Swaro ATS. I also didn't think I was gonna be able to offer that much in way of insights between the ATX 65 and the Kawa 66 because they are so incredibly similar. So that's why I didn't um, bring the ATX in the picture and that's where I think the Kawa sits. Now, if we look at the Leica and the Swaro, this is just pure personal opinion. And if you can, go put your hands on these. If it was me, I'd own the Leica. The double barrel, coarse and fine, focus adjustment to me sets it apart from the Swaro. It's just more pleasing. It's, it's nicer to use. It feels better. Also, with my particular eyes, the eye box in the Leica was more forgiving than any of these, even the Kawa. Like every time I leaned in, I had a full sight picture. I could move my eye around my field of view. I wouldn't black out on me. I didn't see my eyelashes a whole bunch. Like it wasn't as finicky as the rest of them. Out of all of these scopes, the Leica surprised me the most. 
I knew it was going to be good. But I've looked through the Noctavids and the Trinivids, and I thought they were good, but they didn't blow my mind. Like, the Zeiss Victories blew my mind. Like, the crispness, the color profile, they were beautiful. I kind of feel that way about the Leica Televid. It kind of surprised me and blew my mind. You know, it's like when they, people hype up a good movie, and you go and see it, and you're like, yeah, it was good. That's what the Kawa 66. Everyone has been raving about this thing. So when I looked through it, and it was fantastic, I was like, of course it's fantastic. Nobody really talks that much about the Leica. Having looked through the Leica and had it in my hands for a week or two, I am super impressed. Like you will not regret purchasing the Leica. However, I could say almost all of the same stuff about the ATS. So if you have a good budget, but you're a little less risk tolerant, or you want something that has like a longer history, I think the ATS and the Leica are fantastic options. Another note you need to address about the ATS is how light it is. It's four ounces lighter than the Kawa and the Leica. I mean, that's a quarter of a pound. That is not an insignificant weight savings. The ATX is significantly heavier. So that's the other reason that they're, I still think both these spotters are on the market because some people have asked, well, why don't you just, you know, collapse it into the ATX line? I think the you know S line still has a place in the market. So that, that leaves us with the Tract and the Maven. And I will say without hesitation that the viewing experience of the Tract is superior. If you zoom both these spotters into 45X, the Tract is significantly better than the Maven. However, the Maven's only 800 bucks, which is crazy cheap. And it's crazy small and crazy light. Like it's next to nothing. After this review, I'm gonna I'm I'm putting together the pieces over the next few months to be able to do a mini spotting scope review and a range finding bino review. And I'm actually more interested to see how this Maven stacks up against like the ATC from Swaro and that new mini spotter from Vortex because I don't really think it was fair. I think it provided an interesting point of contrast to put it in the mix here, but I didn't really expect that at this size, it was really gonna hold its own with the rest of these. So when you put it like that, it actually de delivered a surprisingly good performance. So if you're looking for like subcompact form factor, super lightweight, can rip it out and put it away super fast, doesn't take up any space in your pack and you've got a low budget, I was pretty impressed with the Maven. Like the other thing that is impressing me more and more with Maven is the ergonomics and the build quality. Like everything always feels so solid on a Maven optic. So I got to give them some credit. Oh, I should also address for any of you who watch a lot of my content, how we even wound up with a Maven spotting scope. When I did this big kind of rant on one of my last reviews, I had this incident with the Maven PR company where they contacted me, said they see my reviews, wanted to offer me an affiliate deal. I said, I don't do affiliate deals, but if you, you'd like to send me some optics, I would love to be able to review more Maven glass. They never got back to me, which basically sent the signal, if you're not willing to be on the payroll and kind of tow the company line, we're not willing to send you free stuff. After I posted that video <laughs> about a week later, another guy at that PR company got in touch with me and he's like, whoa, we need to get on the phone. Something clearly went off the tracks here. So I don't know, you know, I'm not going to get into like why it happened or whatever, but they said very clearly that is not the case. We are not afraid of unsponsored reviews. Uh, it was purely a miscommunication. I'm willing to write it off. Um, everybody makes mistakes. And they have said in future, if you need something, just send us an email. Uh, we'll loan it to you for as long as you need it. And then you just send it back. So I really want to give credit to that team. They stepped up. They're not afraid to, you know, take some heat and expose their glass to unbiased reviews. So I'm glad that we worked that out because I do think Maven offers a really great option for a particular, you know, demographic in the market. So that leaves us with Tract. Like, where does this sit in the lineup? I haven't looked through all of the other kind of really value driven spotting scopes. I've looked through the Vortex Razor. I owned the 65 for about a year and a half 
and I reviewed the 85 uh, last year. This blows the Razer 65 out of the water. So if you're like head to head, do I buy the Vortex Razor 65 or the Tractoric 65? You buy the Tractoric 65. I firmly believe this is a better spotting scope than the Razor. I haven't looked through the loophole. Very challenging to get my hands on loophole glass, to be honest with you. Um, hey, if you work for loophole and you want to lend some glass, give me a shout. Let's, let's work something out because I know a lot of people are always requesting it. I think Leupold, like Tract, like Maven, like Vortex, probably build some really great products in that more value kind of uh, sect of the market. So I can't say definitively the Tract is better or worse than Leupold because I've never looked through the Leupold. But from the spotting scopes that I've looked at and from how well the Tract stacked up against these other spotting scopes, I think for $12.49, it delivers incredible value and a really engaging optical experience. So my friends, there you have it. My attempt at a comprehensive 65 millimeter spotting scope review. I'd be really interested to hear from you guys in the comments. You know, what did you agree with? What did you disagree with? What has been your experience with some of these spotters? Obviously, there are some spotters in this category that I didn't get a chance to look at. What other 65 millimeter spotters would you like me to take a look at? What other categories of optics would you like me to take a look at? Drop all those notes in the comments section below and I'd love to continue the conversation. If you could do me a favor, like, comment, share, subscribe, you know, bump this up the algorithm. YouTube doesn't really favor hunting content and doesn't really organically promote it very well. So if I could get your help in that regard, I would really appreciate it. And as always, until next time, thank you for tuning in.